Well, Darren, in the days leading up to the summit, anticipation is growing here in Nusa Dua in Bali as the island waits for world leaders to arrive for the summit. This is considered a highly consequential summit that takes place at a time as economists describe an, a gloomy economic outlook for next year, concerns about a growing food and energy crisis, and of course, great geopolitical tensions over Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent effects that that invasion has had on the global economy in particular uh, in relation to food and energy. Now, of course, there are rifts within the G20 as this summit takes place. The host, Indonesia, has tried to keep the focus on issues where countries might be able to find common ground. But as we've seen throughout G20 meetings this year, there have been a number of, of meetings of, of finance ministers, foreign ministers, uh, and many other streams of meetings. It has been difficult for uh, those participants to find common grounds at this time of tension because fundamentally the questions of food and energy security have been affected by the war in Ukraine and there are countries within the G20 that say that those issues that affect millions of lives around the world cannot be adequately addressed without calling for Russian accountability and it's it's sort of a, a, a concern within the G20 and in fact has raised questions about uh, what is the purpose of the G20 and indeed if leaders cannot find common ground how successful uh, can this summit be? Of course, the focus will not just be on the main spectacle, the leaders' summit, but the meetings that take place quietly on the sidelines and what can be achieved in those settings. Chief among those meetings that will be keenly watched will be the meeting between President Joe Biden and President Xi Jinping, their first in-person meeting. We expect the issues that we often see at these high-level discussions between Washington and Beijing to come up, uh, issues of, of of course, concerning Taiwan, human rights concerns relating to Xinjiang, and also issues relating to trade. Indonesia, as the host, has tried to keep a unified message and has created a theme of recover together, recover stronger for all its G20 events that it has hosted this year. Now, the pinnacle of these events is, of course, the leadership, the leaders' summit. What remains to be seen is whether or not that message of unity can resonate and can, in fact, have meaning at this time of great geopolitical tension. All right, uh, Jessica Washington, live us there in Bali. Jessica, thank you. UN climate talks in Egypt are reaching their halfway point, but negotiators are still working to address key issues. The two-week meeting in Sharm el-Sheikh started with appeals and warnings from world leaders calling for greater efforts to curb emissions. US climate envoy John Kerry said, his country is ready to discuss moves to address loss and damage compensation, but emphasized all nations have a responsibility to find solutions. Kenyan troops deployed as part of an East African regional force have arrived in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Soldiers will provide assistance to Congolese forces who are battling the M23 rebel group. Well, M23 has been fighting with Congolese troops just north of the city of Goma. Malcolm Way reports. Kenyan soldiers are the latest to arrive in Democratic Republic of Congo under the banner of an East African regional force. It's part of an agreement made by East African leaders earlier this year. They say they'll be supporting Congo's army. The instructions and the concept of the heads of state are very clear. Our Kenyan friends are here on a purely offensive mission. Congo's army says the Kenyan soldiers will help them fight the M23 rebel group. It's widely understood to be a proxy of neighboring Rwanda, although Rwanda denies it. There are about 70 soldiers here. Kenya says in total it'll send a battalion of around 900, which is insignificant compared to the vast territory held by armed groups here in eastern Congo. But people are waiting to find out if these soldiers will actually engage in combat with the M23 rebel group. M23's recent advances have forced nearly 200,000 people from their homes. Congo's army, known as FARDC, has been fighting the rebel group this week. It says it's trying to push them back. Are the Kenyan forces going to fight with the FARDC on the front? Or what is the plan? I believe it's not a question of uh, that. The main thing is the peace and stability within this time. Yes. There's been armed conflict in eastern Congo since Uganda and Rwanda invaded in the 1990s. They've been accused of meddling and looting minerals since then, and of backing M23. 
Ugandan troops entered Congo again a year ago under an agreement with the government. They've since come under the banner of the regional force. Many Congolese people don't want them here. People have demonstrated several times in recent months against Rwanda and Uganda, who they blame for decades of military aggression, and against UN peacekeepers who they blame for failing to protect them. Campaigners say a strengthened Congolese army should defeat the armed groups and that it's Congo's vast mineral wealth that attracts foreign armies. It's money, unfortunately. Whenever there is war, first of all, there's going to be a bill to the Congolese people. And second, well, there will be always mining, petrol, road construction contracts following with that. East Africa's leaders say Kenyan troops and the regional force will bring stability. Yeah. Others here say foreign forces are the problem, not the solution. Malcolm Webb, Al Jazeera, Goma, Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, it's just over seven days remain until the World Cup kicks off here in Qatar, and at least one nation will be bringing the sounds of home to the Middle East. One of Mexico's best-known mariachi bands will be on hand to support their team. And it's not the first time the group has brightened up football's biggest tournament. Mi nombre es Nicolás Melendres. Soy integrante y representante del mariachi, mariachísimo de Guadalajara, Jalisco. Nosotros decimos que el, el mariachi es la esencia de Jalisco en México y la presencia de México en el mundo. Dicen que el guitarrón y la vihuela es lo que diferencia a un mariachi. Una viene siendo el alma y el otro es el corazón de él. Nosotros iniciamos ya hace 15 años. Eh, somos 50 the world, but removing subsidies could actually create a more efficient food system. For example, if global agricultural distortions such as subsidies and tariffs were removed, you could be in a situation where Australian agricultural production increases and even our emissions footprint increases, but global emissions and methane emissions will fall. According to ABES, Australian farmers are some of the least subsidised in the OECD. The latest modelling follows Australia's decision to sign on to a global pledge to reduce methane. And that's Landline News. India is a promising new market for Australian wine. It has the largest population of young people with a developing taste for wine and a new free trade agreement is set to lower tariffs. But as Landline's Kerry State reports, it's unlikely to fill the gap left by the collapse of the Chinese market. I think I love the colour. It's clean, it's clear, it's you know, the salmon pink in colour. At the Pro Wine Trade Fair in Mumbai, alcohol producers from across the globe want a piece of a potential market that no other country can offer. Over the next five years, India will add another 100 million that will join the drinking cohort of consumers. So obviously the younger generation presents a significant opportunity for the growth of every alcoholic beverage in India, including wine. Australians are also here to talk about more than a mutual love of cricket. This is Shiraz from South Australia. And this one's a Cabernet Sauvignon, so the McLaren Vale region, which is a, a sub-region inside of South Australia. So, uh, South Australia region, is particularly uh, well represented. With a group of producers from different regions making the trip, as part of the South Australian government's India Wine Expansion Program. The potential is immense. With enormous population, even though very few drink wine at the moment, we've got enormous ability to get in on the ground floor. India is a spirits market. In fact, it's the world's largest consumer of whiskey. Beer is also popular while wine accounts for only 1% of alcohol consumption. But it's on the move. 
Wine is the new media symbol of sophistication, success, aspirational living and celebration. Wine increasingly is being depicted in Indian movies in a very favorable light. Uh, this is a very positive sign because uh, India and its culture is widely influenced by its movies. What are we going to taste today? We're going to taste six wines from South Australia. Hopefully all the wines are already in your glasses. Sono Holland is India's only master of wine, a qualification that's highly regarded in the industry. She's also a rarity in a country where only 1% of women drink alcohol. Traditionally, drinking of alcoholic beverages has been reserved uh, for the male generation of India. However, increasingly women are taking to wine in a very big way. Because wine has a softer image, women are not daunted or do not feel culturally conscious consuming wine in the presence of their family members or social relatives. The high-profile wine consultant has come on board as South Australia's wine ambassador for India. So we're tasting a really special wine um, and this is a classic Barossa Valley Shiraz. Uh, Up until recently, awareness of Australian wine in India was limited to being perceived as inexpensive, cheerful, youthful, easily accessible wines. Consumers are now becoming more and more aware of the kind of high quality and diversity that can come from some of the higher quality Australian wines. South Australian community. Among the South Australian producers joining her on stage is Guy Adams. Wine is all about passion uh, and the stories. Guy has a passion for many things. The mixed farmer and his wife run a substantial wool and grain operation at Langhorn Creek, southeast of Adelaide. Their family also knows a thing or two about the wine industry. After 130 years of growing grapes and making wines, largely for the overseas market. We've always been focused on export. We really um, believe that export is where the world's going. You get the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, and you really just got to keep pushing through and working with what, you know, is in front of you. So there's always great opportunities out there. The family has felt all the bumps on the exports roller coaster. It used to do a lot of business in the US, but that market fell apart three times. And more recently, they watched 70% of their sales disappear when the Chinese market collapsed over trade disputes and soaring tariffs. But after two visits, Guy is optimistic about India. India has some significant potential. It's going to be a totally different market than China. It'll be a lot more stable market. We'll see this gradual growth. It'll actually get pulled through where they'll actually be, we'll be sending wine in, it'll be consumed and they'll be reordering. Where China was very much an up and down um, growth pattern. It's very varietal, but it's fruity as well. To get buyers, they need to make the right kind of wine. Amazing colour. Yeah, good. 22 is really good. Uh, nice bright colour. Bright aromatics. And when it comes to India, it's all about the reds. Uh, this often baffles people because being a tropical climate, uh, people expect more sparkling wines or white wines to be consumed. However, I think because of people perceiving red wine to be a healthier option, uh, it is definitely more favoured among Indian consumers. It's one of the nicest rosé I have tasted during this whole exhibition. Rosés, both sweet and dry, are on the rise. We think that this is a very nice example of Australian Shiraz. But it's the robust Aussie reds that Sonal Holland says pair well with Indian food. Indian cuisine is very varied. It's very rich with a lot of depth of flavours. So I believe wines need to have equal level of personality and character to them to be able to withstand because unlike other cuisines, Indian cuisine does tend to sometimes compete with the wines at the table. The wines already on offer at the table include both local and international labels. And filling more than a few retail shelves are a selection of Australian wines. Australian wine has got the lion's share of imported wine in India. So we've got 40% of the imported category. So three times Chile, um, France and Italy combined. <laughs> That 
wine is coming from just 24 Australian producers. And perhaps not surprisingly, given its export history, the biggest player is well-known Barossa Valley label Jacobs Creek. Motivated by an emerging middle class, the company, which is owned by French wine and spirits giant Pernod Ricard, made the move into India 21 years ago. We are starting to see significant growth. So with Jacobs Creek in the last year, we've actually grown at 118%. And we don't have many other growing markets for Jacobs Creek, which is why India is really important for us. Especially because like China, it's a red wine market. And right now, without China, red wine is in serious oversupply in Australia, with tanks full in many regions ahead of the 2023 vintage and prices falling. There's no doubt the loss of the Chinese market has left a huge hole. Exports have fallen by $1 billion over the last two years. Now, the question many people are asking is, can the country with the second largest population in the world make up for the loss of the country with the largest? There is no substitution for China, for Jacobs Creek, um, and more broadly the Australian wine industry um, in any short time period. You know, ultimately the only market that we can see that has that long-term growth potential is India. There are many reasons India is not a quick fix. There's a federal tariff of 150% on imported wines. On top of that are significant state taxes. It's not unusual for Australian wine to end up eight to ten times more expensive in India than what it is on the domestic market. So if you go out to a really sort of fancy restaurant, it's not unusual to be charged um, about $60 for a glass of Australian wine, whereas a cocktail might cost you 20 Australian dollars. We have a Chardonnay in this range, which is around the $4 mark. We have another $4. Yeah. Not surprisingly, price points are a big talking point at Pro Wine. And what's your price on this one? So that one lands about, uh, that FOB is about 14 ish. Yeah. So it's still not over the top. Yeah. But what has been over the top is set to become more palatable under a free trade agreement, which is expected to be ratified by the end of the year after delays due to a change of government in Australia. The federal tariff for bottles over five US dollars, which is around eight Australian dollars, will be significantly reduced over 10 years. For what it does, and for that price point, I think it's a great value. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very approachable, very easy. That will make premium wines more affordable for importers to buy and consumers to drink, without threatening the domestic Indian market. For Australia, our future is in premium wines. We are a high cost producer. Our country is always worth labour costs, water costs and the like. So we need to grow a premium offering. And that's the area that has benefited from the tariff reductions under the free trade agreement. But not everyone benefits, which is why Jacobs Creek is lobbying for the cutoff to be lowered from five to two US dollars. The tariff reductions won't help Jacobs Creek at all. It's unfortunate the, the interim trade deal did lack ambition. 98% of wines exported to India are beneath that five US dollar mark. So ooh, only 2% of ooh, current wine yeah. exports will benefit from the interim trade deal. Uh, okay. Aside from the obvious costs, there are complex regulatory requirements the two countries are working to simplify, like India's labelling rules. We'll be given some information that might work for one particular state, but that label won't then work for another state. India is the most challenging market that we export to, but it's also the market with the greatest opportunity that we see. Accessing those opportunities, though, is far from straightforward. You just can't send wine in um, as samples and go, here, um, here's the wine, try this. The wines actually have to get registered. The labels have to be registered. You have to go through that whole process. To get into Pro Wine, I think it nearly took us about nine months to get it effectively ready to be able to be consumed at the show. And it's not allowed to be consumed everywhere. In some Indian states, alcohol is banned. 
And even though it looks to be well and truly accepted here, there's only so much promotional work the Australians can do. Promotion of alcohol is prohibited federally, so you can't go in and promote your wine. So your promotional strategy has to be, um, you know, very, very strategic. So, um, yeah, it's an extremely difficult market to crack. It is the greatest teacher of patience, um, and we see a number of folks uh, come over to uh, India expecting the overnight success uh, and then walk away pretty disappointed. And then they'll go back and, you know, basically say that India stands for, I'll never do India again. But Austrade Commissioner John Southwell, who joined Australian wine industry delegates at ProWine, says India is worth the effort, especially now. What we've been working through, especially over the last, uh, you know, uh, uh, six or seven months, is actually trying to en engage with a lot of folk who have written India off to actually say the landscape has changed with the Hector Agreement. Um, and is it actually worth another look? This relationship building trip to India isn't just about trading wine. It's about trading industry expertise and training opportunities. So when we eventually look to negotiate the next part of the free trade agreement, um, having Indian industry on side is really important and being able to have sort of a two-way dialogue, we're helping them, they can help us, um, is really, really important. In the meantime, South Australia's producers have returned yeah, home to sift the through there. offers from importers. A big decision which can make or break entry uh, into uh, India. And that's probably the, the hard part, uh, to really look at the importers and work out what drives them and whether their business model suits your business model. Because at the end of the day, if you've both got different ideas and where you want to end up, it's all going to go sideways pretty quickly. But he says if the family gets that right, it will be sharing the love with India early next year. And Wine Australia suspects he won't be the only new player heading in that direction. It definitely is a market that Australian producers are looking to invest in, um, particularly once the free trade agreement comes into force. And I think we'll see that number grow quite significantly over the next year or two. <laughs> G'day, I'm Matt Brand. This week, I've been at the Live Exchange Conference in Darwin, which is one of the big events on the calendar for the live export industry. Now, this is a sector that's facing plenty of challenges right now, and in terms of volume, export numbers are well down this year. I caught up with cattle exporter Patrick Underwood, who said the trade with Indonesia is starting to improve and prices are on the up. There's been a, a rapid increase in cattle prices over the last two to three months, but really based on, on tight supply, I think, rather than strong demand. But yeah, we've seen those cattle prices go from sort of low four dollars to through to about five dollars thirty. A lot, a lot of people interested in those big parcels of really good cattle on the floodplain, so they've they've bought out some big money. Five dollars thirty a kilo is great money for cattle producers, but what about exporters and Indonesian customers? Yeah, ha hard to deal with. We've got a you know a weakening rupee, so we're, we're a lot of a lot of um, resistance from our market. Um, but unfortunately, it's a it's an it's an open market here. It's based on supply and demand, and it's. Uh, it's sort of take them at that price or don't take them. The, the Indonesians sort of, you know, struggle on and, and, and take them. They've got Labaran and, and uh, Ramadan, so they want cattle in their feedlots now for, for March, April for their periods of peak demand. So they're, they're sort of, um, you know, doing their best to, to, to take cattle and we'll probably see 30, 40,000 cattle go out of Darwin in the next month. So, you know, that's a busy month. And what's the latest information you have, Patrick, on the spread of foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease over in Indonesia? 
still ramifications there. So it's, it's sort of not spreading anymore. All Australian cattle are vaccinated. Um, local cattle surrounding Australian feedlots are now vaccinated. Um, but, but just legacy issues because they did um, slaughter a lot of their, their local population um, that either was compromised or had FMD. And we're finding that a lot of those are, are, in, are in fridges over there now. So in some of the cold chains, all, all blocked up with product from, from FMD cattle, and that's sort of um, going to work its way through the system. So it, it'll certainly um, take some time um, to, you know, for, for, for the FMD repercussions to be completely over. Um, LSD, there's, a, there's, there's now a confirmed case in, in Java, central Java. It was in, in, in Sumatra. So, um, you know, there's a really interesting session yesterday on, on the likelihood of it getting to Australia. Um, there's, they're still doing a lot of scientific work to try and understand whether those biting insects or, or vectors um, will be capable of carrying lumpy skin disease, you know, a, across the seas to Australia with, you know, a lot of some people saying it's, it's inevitable. Others are saying, I think that, you know, the experts are saying it's a 28% chance, but it's definitely a great concern for the Australian cattle industry. With the wet season approaching, could lumpy skin disease just blow in on the wind? I, look, they're telling me it won't be this year. Um, and, and, and the good thing is that they're doing a lot of work in Timor and some of those countries in the south where lumpy skin hasn't got to, to, to monitor um, and test that it's getting there. So I think we, we, we watch the spread through southern Java, you know, through Bali and see if it comes across to, you know, some of these southern Indonesian islands, which, which really aren't that far from yeah. Australia's north coast or the Tiwi Islands. And Patrick, in ways, the elephant in the room at a conference like this one is the promised phase out of the live sheep trade. I know you're in the business of shipping cattle, but do you have any views on how this is all playing out? Look, we support, in, in the north, there's no sheep, but we support the sheep trade. There's been, you know, vast improvements done. And, you know, across the conference yesterday, there was, there was universal support from, you know, the Northern Church Cattlemen's Association, um, but, you know, across the, across the industry, um, you know, to support a, a, a good, sustainable sheep trade based on animal welfare. Um, you know, we wouldn't like to see it phased out completely because we, we, you know, we, we, we do have fears, even though the Australian government and, and Minister Murray Watt's been very clear that they're not targeting cattle. You know, we just don't know what's next. That's Patrick Underwood from Australian Cattle Enterprises. With more rain forecast across eastern Australia this month, producers made the most of a slightly drier week to sell, which led to some really big yard ins. Here's a bird's eye view of the sheep and lamb sale in Wagga Wagga. It was a record yard in of just over 80,000 head. At one stage, there was 107,000 sheep and lambs booked in, but I'm told a lot of producers heard that number and pulled out. There were big yard ins also at Bendigo and Ballarat, and the weight of numbers dragged prices down. The national heavy lamb indicator falling nearly 70 cents. There was a surge in cattle numbers as well. Nationally, it was the biggest yard in in nearly two years, and about oh, 20,000 head yeah. in front of the weekly average for this year. Overall, though, prices held firm. Just before we get to the wool market, check out this graph from Rabobank on consumer confidence around the world. As you can see, sharp declines wherever you look, especially in China. Its zero COVID policy and lockdown approach has seen consumer sentiment reach its lowest point in years, which impacts demand on a range of agricultural commodities, including wool. The wool market continued its downward trend this week with the greatest falls at the finer end. The Eastern market indicator's impressive rise in mid-October has now been wiped out. Rain means more grain, according to the US Department of Ag. The USDA has increased its crop forecast for Australian wheat by 1.5 million tonnes, saying above average rain over the past few months has supported crop development <laughs> and boosted <laughs> yields. Now, I'm not sure what growers in flood affected areas would make of that, but certainly the picture in South Australia and WA is looking promising. The latest crop update from WA has the West on track for a record 26 million tonne winter crop. To Chicago, where the market will be keeping a close eye on the upcoming G20 <laughs> summit in Bali, any news around the Black Sea Grain Corridor deal will dictate what prices do. I'm told the world is screaming out for milling grade wheat, so there's rising money for quality. Premium wheat prices lifted in Australia this week across multiple zones, and the gap between seabot wheat and domestic prices has closed. In New York, sugar futures have jumped 10% in the last couple of weeks and have now reached their highest point since July. Perhaps a surprising result given this news from India. India has become the world's biggest producer of sugar and is sitting on a record crop. The government has just approved 6 million tonnes for export and mills have reportedly been quick to react 
and lock in deals. And finally, a look at the alternative meat market. Sales in the US suggest consumers are starting to lose their appetite for plant-based meat. Here's a look at the Beyond Meat share price, which has fallen more than 90% since its high in 2019. And its latest quarterly report shows a company that's in trouble. Beyond posted a quarterly net loss of more than 100 million US dollars. It's blaming cost of living pressures and COVID-19 but other factors appear to be high input costs and a lack of repeat sales. That is the Landline Check on prices. Keep it rural. Hi, I'm Helena Bachkovsky, just outside Mount Isa at a phosphate mine. I visit a couple of sites where they're hoping to export the phosphate and sell direct to local farmers. That story, next week on Landline. Boot scooting or line dancing is helping some of Western Australia's oldest community halls get a second lease on life. It's become so popular, participants have created a circuit that allows them to dance in a different hall virtually every day. This story from Ellie Honeybone in Southwest WA. It's Sunday afternoon in Australind and a dance party of a different kind is just about to get underway. Line dancers have gathered at this hall three hours south of Perth for their monthly shindig to whoop it up for a couple of hours before the long drive home to farms all across southern Western Australia. They're a dedicated lot, putting the miles of travel behind them to put their best foot forward for boot scooting and old time numbers from a live band who themselves have travelled over 300 kilometres just for the gig. Our members themselves come from Perth to Albany, to Bustleton, Dunsborough, all around the Bastille. southwest, and that's Bastille. when they travel. Some people follow bands. Bastille. When we have bands that come from Albany, they Bastille. bring an entourage Bastille. of caravans with them, so we have eight or ten caravans come and stay over at, at the park where we are. So it's really just a group of life-minded people that travel all over the yeah. southwest, basically. Sure that These travellers uh, are doing more than just dancing. They're helping abandoned community halls throughout the regions find a second lease of life. And there are country towns that don't have a country yeah. music um, club. So mm. by being the Southwest Club, we can go to the different venues and breathe a little bit of extra life in, which is just great because each each hall has its own community that comes along. So it, no, it's just brilliant. I love it. halls are being booked to host monthly dances or weekly practices like this one in Dingup, deep in the heart of WA's southwest. Bill Phillips has longer ties than most to this hall, which was rebuilt by local farmers in the late 1940s, after fire raised the original just seat, it would make a difference yeah, because what like Joe Biden has often yeah. contended with yeah. is opposition yeah. to yeah. Uh, bills he wants yeah. to pass yeah. from yeah. two prominent senators, uh, Joe Manchin and Kirsten yeah. Cinema. Yeah. So that extra seat would just give him a little yeah. bit of wiggle room yeah. there uh, if he yeah. could get one of them over the line. But clearly, yeah. the yeah. next yeah. two yeah. years yeah. of his presidency uh, yeah. in yeah. terms yeah. of trying yeah. to push yeah. through yeah. legislation yeah. will be a lot more difficult yeah. because we yeah. still yeah. think, yeah. although it's, at, it's not definite, but we still think that the Republicans uh, will take the House. And Barbara, how do the results now reflect on the influence of yeah. Donald Sorry, Trump? Sorry, Federation. Billy. Look pretty badly. Um, a number of his prominent candidates have not managed to win through. Uh, we saw that key race in Pennsylvania where the celebrity doctor Mehmet Oz uh, was defeated by John Fetterman. That's despite yeah. Fetterman really struggling uh, with the after effects of a stroke, uh, really struggling on the campaign trail. Essentially, Adam Luxalt, another uh, key Trump endorsey there, losing out in Nevada, albeit very narrowly. We are still 
waiting for a woman who's been getting a huge amount of attention. That's Carrie Lake in Arizona, an absolute Trump acolyte, essentially, an election denier, um, happy to be called Trump in a dress. Um, now, her result is also still pending, also a pretty close race. You can certainly be sure that the president, former president will latch on to that if she does win. But of course, big questions being asked within the Republican Party as to whether they really want Trump leading them forward. And this is with Trump um, apparently still pushing ahead with plans next week to announce that he's running in 2024. The cries and the criticisms of him are pretty vocal and pretty loud, but for the moment, uh, that still appears to be his intention. <laughs> Residents across New South Wales are being warned thunderstorms forecast for today could dump up to 150 millimetres of rain and cause further flooding across western parts of the state. There are currently 94 warnings in place across the state with 12 at emergency status. The Bureau of Meteorology says it is most concerned about areas already affected by flooding. The SES has been working to resupply a number of communities isolated by flooding during the past few weeks and says this forecast may mean some residents will have to evacuate their homes again. This will cause, likely cause, renewed river rises. Uh, so in some areas it will mean continued isolation of communities, uh, increasing the resupply operation. Uh, in other areas, potential evacuations uh, for communities that have just recently gone back into their homes. Meanwhile, power is slowly returning to some areas in South Australia after severe thunderstorms lashed the state and brought down trees. Reporter Shari Harris has more from the Adelaide Hills. So around 80,000 homes are currently without power and we are hearing it could be until Tuesday until it's restored. Uh, we're here in Upper Stir in Adelaide's Hills at the moment and you can see behind me this house has been crushed by a tree. It follows last night's wild weather. There was nearly half a million lightning strikes and more than 100 kilometres per hour winds. So there's many homes like this in the area right now. Emergency services are door knocking to see who's home um, and they're trying their best to go from house to house to see if everyone's OK. And Shari, it was quite an extensive weather system that moved through the state. How is the cleanup going? Yeah, so the clean the cleanup is going. There's lots of power lines down. We are hearing from SA Power Network that backup from New South Wales will be sent in today. Around 80 employees from Essential Energy will be travelling over to help to try to get that power back to 80,000 80, homes. So um, there's lots of trees down. Um, there's lots of traffic lights that aren't working. So the city does seem quite hectic at the moment as emergency services are working. It's all hands on deck. Minister for Cyber Security Claire O'Neill says the federal government is considering making it illegal for companies to pay ransoms to online criminals. Medibank refused to meet a $15 million ransom demand, prompting Russian hackers to release troves of stolen customer data online. Claire O'Neill says that was the right decision and the government will consider a reform to deter future cyber attacks. I think it's pretty um, clear that Medibank were right not to pay the ransom yeah. because if I have never seen people that lack a moral code so clearly than the hackers who are releasing data about data Australians really online. On, right? yeah. yeah, and the idea that we're going to, you yeah. know, trust these people to delete mm. data that they have taken off and may have copied a million times is just frankly silly. Um, so I think that was the right decision and we're yeah. standing strong yeah. as a country yeah. against this. We don't want to fuel the ransomware business model. Millions of hungry and starving people in Tigray, in Ethiopia's so north, man. could soon receive food shipments under a truce deal. The Ethiopian military and Tigrayan rebels yeah. have agreed to allow immediate, yeah. unhindered aid deliveries to yeah. the region. It's estimated half yeah. of Tigray's 5.5 million people yeah. need food, 
with many of them starving. Commanders from both sides have signed a deal in Kenya to cease hostilities, which was agreed to on November the 2nd, following two years of fighting. Russian authorities have chosen a little known city in southeast Ukraine to be the temporary capital of the Kherson region after Ukrainian troops forced the Russian occupiers out of the city. The city of Henichesk, 200 kilometres southeast of Kherson, has been given the interim title. Moscow has tried to remain upbeat about its military setbacks in Ukraine, claiming Russian forces have killed hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers in recent operations and destroyed most of their equipment. U.S. climate envoy John Kerry says his country is showing the way to battle carbon emissions at the COP27 United Nations Climate Change Conference in Egypt. As the climate talks near the halfway point, negotiators are working to draft deals on a wide range of issues they'll put to ministers next week. Mr Kerry says President Joe Biden has shown the US is committed to taking action on climate and has shown the way other countries can join in. The president outlined how the Inflation Reduction Act not only puts the United States on track to meet our ambitious 2030 target, but will also help, and importantly, especially at a meeting like this, will help other countries to be able to do what they need to do uh, and, and to drive down the cost of clean technologies and to help make certain that those new clean technologies get distributed to the world. Two World War II era planes have crashed at an air show in the US city of Dallas. Several videos posted on Twitter show the plane's rapid descent, which caused a large fire and plumes of black smoke to billow into the sky. While it's unclear how many people were on board, authorities say the two planes are expected to be crewed by up to six people in total. We had two aircraft flying, one's a B-17, one is a P-63. The B-17 normally has a crew of four to five, but that was what was on the aircraft, and the P-63 is a single piloted fighter type oh, aircraft. Yeah. Uh, there was an incident, it is being investigated by the, the uh, FAA right now. The families are being taken care of, they're receiving counseling, uh, not just of those actively participating in the issue, but also the CAF uh, folks and any folks so here, uh, that may have seen it and have, have issues with what they saw. 21 people have been killed and six others were injured when a bus fell into a canal in northern Egypt. The bus was carrying 35 people when it veered off a highway and fell into the waterway in Aga, 100 kilometres northeast of the capital Cairo. It's the second major crash in Egypt in two weeks. After 11 people died when a minibus and a truck collided 150 kilometres north of Cairo. The demilitarized zone separating North and South Korea is not the place you'd expect to find an Australian-led military operation. But in recent years, Australia's Defence Forces have taken charge of a unique mission there. Operation Linesman aims to give closure to families who lost loved ones in the Korean War some seven decades ago. Planning to enter treacherous territory. Some part of Area 3 has been um, demined. These Aussie defence personnel have signed on for deployment in a stretch of land labelled the world's most dangerous border. During the war, lots of explosives and lots of mines were placed. Wearing protective gear and clearly visible identification, the trio make their way past the heavily fortified fence. What lies beyond are the scars of a conflict frozen in time. South Korean soldiers dig into the soil, finding relics from the war. The Australians ensure the delicate armistice is being adhered to. The aim of all this is to find the fallen and get them home. 
there are still families out there waiting for return of their family member and it's important to do the closure for those families and need to ensure that we remember that their sacrifice and the service has not been forgotten. For June He, it's also provided an opportunity to learn about what her grandparents endured many decades ago. None of my parents heard any of these war stories. It was just unspoken of because they don't want to share this sorrowful history. That sorrowful history is on full display at the National Cemetery Channel in the capital, Seoul. It's here the remains of Kim Young Hwan's eldest brother are kept. His body was only retrieved this year, ending 70 painful years of not knowing. There are still people who have not been found. Even though I found my brother, I can't be happy when there are other families still grieving. More than 450 bodies have been discovered since remains recovery began back in 2019. It's expected more than 10,000 troops from the South and its allies are still laying somewhere on the ground across the demilitarised zone. This important work is really only just getting started. We still have 42 Australians uh, remaining on the peninsula MIA. I'm really sorry for the Australian soldiers who passed away here. I want to say thank you to Australia for saving our country. Providing an opportunity for closure. James Oten, ABC News, the demilitarised zone. Australia will be looking to win the Billie Jean King Cup for the first time since 1974 when it meets Switzerland in Glasgow tomorrow morning. Australia defeated Great Britain two rubbers to one in the semi-final of the competition, previously known as the Fed Cup. World number 237, Storm Sanders, beat Heather Watson in straight sets before Isla Tomjanovic had a surprise loss to Harriet Dart. Sanders teamed up with Sam Stoza to win the decisive doubles match 10-6 in a super tiebreaker. You know, we're still making up for the final we lost a couple of years ago. We, we know what that feels like. Um, well, we're optimistic, we're a team, um, we've got great support, so it's ours for the taking. We've just got to go for it and see what happens. The Wallabies have lost to Italy for the first time after missing a conversion attempt to win the game in Florence. The Wallabies made 11 changes to the team that had a narrow loss to France and trailed 17 points to three after 27 minutes. Australia scored after the siren to narrow the deficit to one point. Debutante fly half Ben Donaldson was unable to convert the try and Italy celebrated one of its greatest victories. Taking a look around the country for tomorrow. In Queensland, isolated showers and thunderstorms about the Western Peninsula. Widespread showers and thunderstorms, some severe across the northwest and the southern inland. Partly cloudy elsewhere. In New South Wales and the ACT, showers and thunderstorms for the east, mostly in the morning. The west will be dry and mostly sunny. Patchy showers over the southern and eastern parts of Victoria, tending scattered on and south of the divide. Showers falling in snow about the alpine peaks in the evening. Rain expected across Tasmania, easing in the north and east during the evening. Also a chance of thunderstorms about the north and east in the morning and afternoon. In South Australia, showers are expected over the agricultural area. Heavier about the southern agricultural area, mid-north, the southwest of the Flinders district and near western coast. In WA, showers and gusty thunderstorms for the northern and eastern Kimberley with light showers over the southern coastal districts. A chance of morning fog about the far southwest Kimberley and far northwest Pilbara. And in the NT, sunny across the Lassiter, Tanami and Simpson districts. A slight to medium chance of showers and thunderstorms elsewhere, reaching a high chance about the eastern Barclay district and the top end. Now to Tuesday's forecast for the national capitals. Mostly sunny for Brisbane, Sydney and Canberra. Showers increasing in Melbourne. Rain for Hobart. 
Adelaide cloudy, sunny in Perth and a possible thunderstorm for Darwin. And now we'll leave you with a message from Expression Australia on some of the big stories of the week, starting with Movember. This month we celebrate Movember, an annual event where many Australians grow a moustache to raise awareness for men's health issues, such as prostate cancer and men's suicide. The now infamous movement began in 2003 when friends Travis Garone and Luke Slattery from Melbourne were discussing fashion trends over a beer and joked about bringing back the moustache. Inspired by a friend's mother who was fundraising for breast cancer, they decided to create politics. That could be one another casualty. The oh, Biden administration policies on climate change and military support for Ukraine could come under threat. Well, forget about climate change, that's over. There will be no discussion of it whatsoever. They will radically expand fossil fuel uh, licensing and exploration in the country. Uh, and, and they'll shut down the government if they don't get their way. As for foreign policy, the Republicans are going to flip America on its head. They're going to side with Vladimir Putin to defeat Ukraine. Some political commentators are concerned close results around the country will be challenged in the courts. Bill Kristol, who worked for Republican Presidents Reagan and Bush, fears that will further polarise an already divided nation. I'm very worried about political violence. I'm, I'm worried about it in the very, very short term if the election results are contested and, and uh, people uh, start spreading big lies. We could have many uh, versions of January 6th at state capitals. Um, there's so many arms, you know, so many armed people who could assemble and try to intimidate election uh, you know, vote counters and so forth. So very short term, I think it could be um, a mess and, and unseemly and, and, and dangerous. Many of the new Republicans elected to the House are avowed supporters of former President Donald Trump and support his claims of a stolen 2020 election. And by the way, does anybody believe that Joe had 80 million votes? Does anybody believe that? We are going to have another election in this country in two years, and you now have uh, a lot of MAGA Republicans in charge of elections in this country. and. Um, many of them results if they don't agree with the outcome. And so I think this really is a precarious moment. Thank you. One of the early Republican victories on the night was Senator Marco Rubio 